welcome to the Delphi Economic Forum. I'm Fade Ulgaria and today I have the honor and the pleasure to discuss about the future of Europe after the war in Ukraine with three European officials. Uh, the Federal Minister for the EU and Constitution of Austria, Caroline Stadler, the Alternate Minister of Foreign Affairs of Greece, Miliadis Varvitsiotis, and uh, Vincenzo Mendola, the State Secretary for European Affairs of Italy. Hello, it is an honor uh, to have you all here uh, today with us. Um, the topic we're going to discuss um, today, the future of Europe after the war in Ukraine, is a topic that concerns and worries almost every European. Before my questions, I would like uh, to give uh, five minutes to each one of you uh, to present uh, your positions, and we're going to take it from there. Uh, Mrs. Ed Sadler, please, you have the floor. Thank you so much. And first of all, thanks for the invitation and a very interesting topic because I think that's the topic all citizens of the European Union are interested in. We all agree that uh, since the 24th of February this year, everything changed. Nothing is like it seems to be unless that date. And this will really mark a change in European history. But it's on us to react in an appropriate way. And I have the impression at the moment we are facing such a rank of challenges that we should do everything at the same moment. And for that, I'm rather, yeah, to, to be happy would be the wrong word in, in, in these times. But uh, I'm, I'm confident that we can really face the challenges and do things that we can face a better future in the, in the, in the, in the, in the future, in the near future, because we started discussing the future of Europe already one year ago. And this was timely to start the discussion. At the moment, we are seeing that we are already living the conference on the future of Europe. We agreed only a few weeks, two weeks ago, on the strategic compass. We have uh, to create our architecture on defense and security policy completely new. We are facing challenges we never thought that we will see in the 21st century. And, um, for that, it was good to already include all the citizens. But now we have to make decisions. We have to reduce our dependencies of energy regarding Russia. We have uh, to create common system regarding security and defense, not only in cybersecurity, but also in ordinary uh, war like we are seeing now in Ukraine. And we have to take the citizens on board. We will face a lot of challenges uh, in the next weeks, months, and I am an optimist, but I would say in the next years. We are not sure what will come, but we see there is a high inflation. We see that we have to prepare people to be flexible also in reaction. And we have to take them on board when it comes to the sanctions, because uh, I think they will last for much more time than we are seeing it and, and, and thought uh, they will from uh, now on. So. What I see and what brings me to a positive end of these first five minutes is that we are facing a unity now in the European Union I never saw before. And I, I'm really pleased that you, Miltianis, uh, invited me also. I'm very pleased uh, that, uh, uh, Vincen Vincenzo, uh, you are there also in our uh, GAC meetings. We see the General Affairs uh, meetings uh, of the Ministers of Europe that there is not only a unity, but also a strength in trying to understand the other's position. And only one last example. If we are discussing sanctions from time to time, and every, again and again, the gas and uh, oil embargo is coming up. And in the meantime, it is so clear for everyone in the European Union that there is, n there is not an option to have an embargo while countries, and I'm talking also of Austria, are dependent on gas, on on the example of Austria, of 80%. So what I feel now is this common sense in facing the challenges together, finding solutions, they will harm us. Out of question, they will harm our citizens. But we are doing it together, and I think uh, then we uh, can really succeed to build a better future. Mr. Ravitsiotis, please. Well, I think that uh, the European experiment is actually growing and becoming even stronger uh, during crisis. And I'm not going to discuss about how we are dealing with Ukraine, but I'm going to say how we actually dealt with the COVID crisis. We brought together a European vaccination plan. We brought together one super weapon to defend our economies and our common currency. 
the Recovery and Resilience uh, Fund, we actually agreed on how to circulate in Europe with a digital uh, certificate and we put together a lot of coordination in order to open and close on an appropriate way and uh, in, uh, in a timely manner with the, with the other member states. And this made us stronger. And now it comes a new challenge, a challenge of the energy crisis and the security crisis. And regarding the energy crisis, which is maybe the thing that actually affects our citizens more and our economies more than anything else, we are discussing for already, I think, nine months on how to deal with it. The economists were predicting that it would be an effect that it would actually peak during the winter time and then it would de-escalate, de and this was the original prediction. They are proven to be wrong, and this is an ongoing crisis, and now we are talking seriously. At the beginning we took it light, now we are talking seriously, and I think that we need to take in the next European Council all the appropriate measures in order. First of all, to defend the prices and to have actually good prices for our economies. The second, to have enough, uh, enough energy resources. And the third is to actually explore all the other areas from which we can bring in gas in, uh, in the European energy mix. And one of these areas is the Eastern Mediterranean, where we have enough reserves in order to outnumber the, and lower the dependency on the Russian gas. And we have to act fast, regardless of what other partners say. The final point, the unity we have shown in, in imposing the sanctions and the coordination and the work that has been done prior to imposing the sanctions was actually, uh, was actually applauded by the, the international community and also brought in a, a, a response from the Russian side that they wouldn't expect so much, so many things to be agreed in so little time. But this is not the end of the history. I think this is the beginning of the history. Caroline mentioned the strategic compass. I think we have to do more. And we have actually to do more. We have, in order to do more, we have to invest more. Germany took a gigantic step. And we have to facilitate the investments on defense by actually uh, not taking them into account when we are talking about the debt and the deficit, because we have to act fast in order to build up our capabilities. Ms. Ramandola, please. Yeah, first of all, I appreciated a lot what uh, Carolina and Milciadis mentioned, that is the, the mainstream of what we discussed in the last council, in the last General Affairs Council, that is the sense of unity in front of the, of the troubles that we lived in the last four years. And if we speak about what we have to do uh, with the, 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 the worst situation that we could ever imagine, a war in the in the center of our continent, first of all, I think that we have a responsibility to speak to our public opinion in a clear way. First of all, how will be Europe after the war? First of all, we have to win this war. And when I say win this war, means explaining to our public opinion what's the, the main issue that we have in front of us. You remember that three, four years ago, before COVID, uh, the, the, the idea of Europe was a, fragi a fragile continent with democratic bases that were unsuccessful, useful to, to, to deliver the decision. And this rhetoric of uh, less democracy, less freedom, and more aut authoritarian <laughs> system could have been more helpful to address all the problems. You remember what was the discussion when Putin uh, made this interview on Financial Times? Liberal democracy is useless to the address the problem that we have. So first of all, the, the, the center of the resistance that we have to, to have it in front of us, supporting, of course, the Ukrainian uh, presidency, is to address this point. We have a battle also on value, 
What does it mean liberal democracy? Or what does it mean for our people uh, to defend with the mainstream of uh, our experience? In this sense, the unity that we are showing is wonderful occasion uh, to overcome problems that we had in the past, to, to give a clear dimension to this word strategic autonomy. We discussed many times strategic autonomy. Uh, it's a wonderful slogan, but we have to put inside this slogan also clear dimension of uh, unity, unity on energy, unity on uh, migration uh, uh, solidarity system in terms of security uh, mechanism. We have to also to address defense and security. We have to address the governance in terms of economical development. We have also to address our global role, because for many years competitiveness was within the continent, Why nowadays we have to compete in terms of also trade, in terms of global legal standard with other global actors like China, like United States, like all the countries that are surrounding our continent. So uh, when Milciadis and Carolina were speaking about unity, uh, they are speaking about a new track that we started in the last year, COVID, uh, the economical recession, and then the war. That is the main big point that we have in front of us. Europe was built up on uh, stopping ending war. And nowadays we know that this concept of war that is uh, surrounding us on the eastern border, but also on the Mediterranean for many years, is something that has to move a new step of integration among ourselves. So, we have to win this war. We have to, to win this war in terms of value, in terms of defending our uh, idea, because this is the main idea of the European unity that is under discussion. When you violate the sovereignty of a country, you are violating, of course, the international law. But uh, you are also violating the idea that is currently we brought after 89 in terms of enlarging the European perspective and defending the liberal democracy. So, Unity, strategic autonomy, global role of European Union is what we are building all together. And I think that among our work and among our work that we do regularly is not just uh, putting together document, but we are basically moving in a new direction, the European integration. So it's a tragic moment, but it's also at the same moment something that can move, it can make, especially for our public opinion, for the European citizen, something that changed the perspective for the next uh, years. As you mentioned before, uh, Mr. Vavitsiotis, one of the biggest concerns right now of Europe and of the Europeans uh, is energy, not only because of the prices that are rising, causing multiple problems to European societies, but also because of energy uh, efficiency. You mentioned before that we should focus on the Mediterranean. Which do you think can be the fate of East Med pipeline, for example? Well, let's not focus only on the pipeline, mm -hmm. because there are several ways f with which you actually make, a, you make use of this gas that is there. The thing is that uh, we have invested, and we are keen on investing more on renewables. Mm -hmm. That's w ultimately, that is the goal, and we should actually focus on the goal, because it's not only, only good for climate change, but it's also good for our economies. At the end of the day, the renewables are going to be the cheaper resource of energy. And it is going to actually make us stronger because we are not going to depend geopolitically but by any provider. So this is this goal we should stick with. The other thing is that definitely fossil fuels, they are not going to be obsolete in, in 20 years or 30 years. We are going to make use of fossil fuels. And these fossil fuels should come from all the possible resources and areas, either from the States, from the Gulf, and of course, of the immediate neighborhood, the Mediterranean neighborhood. And through that, we should engage more and more the North African countries into our European economies. We are looking far away in China, we are looking far away in, uh, in South America, but in our immediate neighborhood and the underbelly from which we actually rely for our security is the Mediterranean. There should be a mix, you're saying, so they're not big dependencies. 
I think, I, I think that we should increase also the, the possibility of bringing in gas or electricity from the countries of uh, uh, North Africa. Uh, this is happening from Algeria to Italy through a pipeline. There is the Libya perspective, there is the East Med perspective, there is Egypt itself that uh, actually can be a, an electricity provider apart from a gas uh, provider. And of course, what we have to do in, in, within the Union is to build up the networks. Mm -hmm. Because what we have realized is that every country has a different energy mix than the other. So there isn't one solution, one that can fit all. And because we have so many differences in our energy mix that shows that there is a need for more unification. And in order to do that, you need to build up the grids. Mm -hmm. Mr. Amendola, Italy uh, announced just a few days after the Russian invasion that it's, it's going to take steps to uh, reduce the dependency from Russian gas. Which are the steps? Yeah, the steps is on the, um, looking what uh, Milciadis was mentioning is in this double dimension, European one and national one. Mm -hmm. Of course, for the national one, we are speaking about 30 BCM with the gas coming from Russia. So the reduction that we are counting is two-thirds already in the next six months because we are going to empower more the, uh, the, the, the pipe coming from Africa, from Algeria was mentioned. That there is also the, uh, the, the tap that is in place. There is also African LNG. So the, the point is that we are calculating, of course, growing uh, our independence from Russian gas. It's not possible to do from the day to the morning. This has to be clear because otherwise we are selling a, a slogan. What we have to do is planning because we need, first of all, the, a diversification of our sources. Secondly, uh, to, to create a, a European system. The Commission did this repower energy that, that there are many good ideas working on common purchasing and storages, working and investing on uh, interconnection. I think the European Bank of Investment can be very useful for this. Uh, creating a, a common energy market that protects the strategic autonomy of European Union. Uh, at the second moment, we, you know, at the second level is also to, to, to grow up with the renewable because we are too late in this uh, development. We are even negotiating this fit for 55 packages that is bringing Europe to, to green transition. So if I have to be uh, practically uh, addressing the, the, the emergency that we have, LNG is the priority, LNG looking the sources from Africa and the Mediterranean, that is one of the richest areas from Egypt to Lebanon uh, to Cyprus in terms of uh, possibilities, working on renewable, a third creating this European common, uh, common market in the sense also not just in terms of uh, protecting ourselves. I make you a strict example and I close. We are working a lot uh, with many countries on this, putting a cap price to the gas coming from Russia. Russia has no alternative in terms of uh, uh, pumping gas to Europe because the pipes are, are just dead. And so uh, we are discussing that every day we give uh, almost 1 billion euro to Mr. Putin to deliver the war in Ukraine. And we are not able, all together, 27 countries to negotiate was the level of uh, uh, increase or paying the, the bill to the, to the gas arriving from Russia. Why am I mentioning this? Because it's a new birth, this European Union energy. And so it's a new birth to, to, to create a market where all the different energy mix, because there are some countries that have nuclear, some other like our, no. But we have to create a, a an architecture in terms of solidarity and also in terms of reaction to the global actor while, like in the case of Russia, are using this money for delivering war all over the continent. So this field is a new birth, is something that is very, is very intensive. We have to be pragmatic, we have also to be ambitious. And between Italy, I think Greece and Austria, there are interconnections for the future. 
you will see that we are going to be the most useful for the future of this uh, European energy because it's working this, uh, uh, this production and delivery is working and is going more in the southern dimension. So we are going to, to plan a, a also a, a door to the European Union. Just the last mention, Milcia is, is right. Uh, we have a sister for this project, for the Green Deal, and the sister is Africa where we can exchange our technological capability in terms of renewable energy, supporting the resilience and the, and the growth of the, of the country, not just the Mediterranean, but also going farther, and to have an exchange in terms of uh, uh, climate neutrality that is the object for 2050, and also having this global uh, projection that we need it for our continent. Mr. Sadler, we are discussing about energy dependencies, which is, of course, a major issue, but there are other concerns as well. For example, for global chain supplies, we have great dependencies regarding raw materials. What do you think about that? Well, first of all, I, I would like to second what my colleague said. We have to use all the sources to be less dependent on Russian oil and gas. And we are doing already a lot within the European Union. I would like to remind you that we concluded already in a common purchase of gas so that the prices can be kept a little bit lower than they would be if every country of the European Union is, is buying uh, gas and gas and oil by themselves. Secondly, um, I fully second what Vincenzo mentioned. We can't do these changes from one day to another. And we should be really realistic and also honest to people. A CEO in Austria told me a few days ago, he said, worse than, uh, than uh, expensive gas or oil is no, no oil or no, no gas. And it's a matter of fact that Austria is dependent as a landlocked country. Mare Nostrum was in former days. Now we are uh, having a good cooperation with Italy. No, but uh, jokes aside, uh, we don't have the opportunities that other countries uh, with the sea have. So um, we have to face these things. We have to prepare people that the challenging times will come. And they won't be over in a few weeks or months. And on the other hand, we have already the discussions on the strategic compass. So, for example, the European Chips Act. Mm -hmm. I think that's really something very important. On the other hand, again, here we have to stay realistic. We cannot substitute everything uh, which is coming now from China, for example, even if we are facing now a dependency which is not convenient for us. So what do we have to do? We have to plan. We have to be smart politicians. And I'm catching up with the last panel when I heard um, that the politicians are becoming less and less smart, so I hope this is not for the present ones. Um, we are trying everything uh, to be smart and to cooperate. And the most important thing, and this I would like to tell you is happening, is to keep the unity of the European Union. But this is not coming along without discussions. And it's like in a family, where you have the most intensive boundaries, you have the most emotional discussions. This is okay as long as you keep the unity from, for the outside. And we as a European Union um, can be a global player when we are keeping and if we are keeping this, this unity. If we are preparing people, and I'm talking to you also, preparing them that things are becoming more and more expensive. If it's not the thing from China, then it will cost a lot more mm -hmm. uh, if we are producing that in Europe. That is a decision we are taking, but we have to, the need, and that's what I uh, tried to mention in my first statement, we have the need to bring people on track, to keep them on track, to go in the same direction with us, uh, that we uh, are not facing situations like we are at, uh, facing at the moment. This will be a little bit difficult to explain to people, as you understand, True. because the problem is very present, True. is now. Uh, Mr. Babitsiotis, let's go to foreign policy and uh, security. Are there any lessons to be learned from the war in Ukraine? Do you think that this war is going, this invasion is going to be a turning point for Europe? Definitely. The, the 24th of February was the 9-11 of Europe. This is obvious. Everything had changed in terms of architecture. And uh, the biggest change has happened in Germany, actually. Germany uh, changed its direction 180 degrees. Uh, what we have uh, has been a policy of appeasement of, uh, of uh, Putin 
uh, Putin's ambitions in playing a, a role in the greater uh, region has, has come to an end. And we are open in defending values, not actually confronting directly on the ground because we are not combating, but definitely defending the values of sovereignty, the values of liberal democracy, and the value that a, a, uh, um, the country and the people of the country, a nation, may decide with whom they will align and with whom they will march in the future. President uh, Zelensky is now talking to the Greek parliament. And he said and he used what used to be the, uh, the slogan of our war of independence. Freedom or death. Eleftheria y thanatos. And I think it's very commoting for the Greek public to understand that the values defending in Ukraine are not some new values, but are there for years. And this has been a quest of the, of, of, of the people to actually live in freedom. And sometimes you have to sacrifice peace in order to defend freedom. And this, this has been actually the case uh, for our nation, but also for other nations as well. In this architecture, it's important what Caroline has said and has talked a lot about the unity. Mm -hmm. And I think that the unity is not, should not be taken for granted. We have to work in order to have unity. They are going to, to break and they are going to push us to break our unity in imposing the sanctions. For example, we have imposed the sanctions. Other partners are not imposing these sanctions and making a profit, actually, of the sanctions, like Turkey, who is welcoming the, the oligarchs to bring their yachts uh, in, in their Mediterranean ports and facilitating, probably, some of the exchanges uh, and the payments that should be done and also facilitates the incoming and outcoming tourism to, uh, especially outcoming tourism uh, from uh, Russia through the Istanbul airport. The other thing, we want to actually go and negotiate and renegotiate with uh, putting all our leverage in, in order to get a better price for, from the Russian gas. And we had yesterday an announcement, I don't know whether it's, it, it developed from the Hungarian uh, finance minister, that he was willing to pay in rubles for the gas that Hungary is importing. This is a break in our unity. Because if we are going to pay in rubles without renegotiating, not even the price, that means that we are multi-financing the war of Mr. Putin. And this should not be tolerated. A final point on unity. We have to make sure that we all go by the same rules. In order, first of all, to, to let populism out of the question, we have to defend what is there to be known as the rule of law. That means free media, open and fair elections, inter, uh, independent justice system, defending every single value at the utmost, uh, at the maximum we can do. Because Europe is actually the area, the only global area that rule of law is so important. And democracy and all the freedoms are so important. And we have to defend it because this is what we stand for. Mr. Sadler, uh, do you think that uh, the war changed everything? Uh, do you think that now Europe uh, will, sta will start standing behind its commitments for unity. Mr. Ravitsiotis mentioned, for exa the example, of Hungary. First of all, yes, I guess the war changed everything. Uh, and uh, I also found out that I'm a pacifist uh, from the first moment I, I was born. And I could not imagine that, for example, things like the Council of Europe uh, have to be without Russia, even if it is very clear that they have to be excluded at, at that moment. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, millions of people are having not the opportunity to lodge a complaint or an application to the European Court of Human Rights. That's a tragedy. So, yes, 
this war changes everything. This war needs us to stay united, as we mentioned uh, all the time, and if we are united a lot, I guess, but this will uh, not um, be the case without really hard internal discussions. And this is a good thing. To discuss the several standpoints is good. What is happening now is that we understand better the position of other countries. Um, I always said, and, and I'm coming a bit from the tra tradition of the Council of Europe, never judge someone in whose shoes you didn't walk. So don't judge someone who is now dependent, for example, on gas, because it's the past. We have to deal with the future, and we have to start dealing with the future now. And there is one other very important thing. We have to be clear that we missed already a lot in the past. I'm talking, for example, of the region of the Western Balkan countries. A very close region here from Greece, um, for example, North Macedonia, which, which did already a lot, changed the name, is waiting in the waiting room for the next step in the accession process since at least two years now, uh, as in March 2020, we decided to start the accession process for Albania and North Macedonia. It was blocked by one country. I have the impression now these things are much more clear also in the minds of the leaders of Europe. And this is the next step we have to do to show them, of course, we have to show solidarity towards Ukraine. And it's, it's, I, I support what the um, president of uh, the commission said. Uh, Ukraine, they, have Western, uh, they are Western-oriented. They have, of course, the right to lodge an application for becoming a member of the European Union. Clear. And emotionally also clear that President Zelensky wants to become a full member of the European Union at the moment. But we should not forget that there are countries, six countries of the Western Balkans, who are desperately waiting for the next step, who are a question of security for the European Union, and it is also a question of credibility for the European Union. And I would really say it is five past 12. And if we are not reacting now, we will lose these countries to the influence of, of Russia and other countries. So do you think that uh, Europe should be more flexible as far as concerned the conditions for the accession of the, the Western Balkans? Well, we, we changed the system. We have a new methodology since March 2020. I think this was an important step to have a more accurate accession process. It, it, also, it always depends also on the countries. What are they doing with the reforms and so on and so forth. But Europe should simply keep its promises that's what I'm asking for. Keep the promises, otherwise we are completely incredible. Ms. Ramendola, how do you think uh, Europe should react uh, to the applications of uh, Moldova, Georgia and Ukraine, of course, uh, to enter in the European Union? First of all, we have to react in the sense that we have to, uh, to show solidarity to Moldova that is also receiving many refugees from Ukraine, solidarity in practice, not just in wording, and say clearly to, to the, the, the to Ukrainian, to the Moldovian and the other country that the future of their country is in Europe. And uh, their feeling is we share it. And the process that we want to open in terms of candidacy will, be, will bring to, of course, uh, a procedure that the Commission will present us um, to have just one family. But Carolina, she's right. I mean, uh, the, the enlargement is not just um, a treaty procedure, bureaucratic, uh, let's say, way. It's also a geopolitical view. And the delay that we are having in, uh, in, uh, in the Western Balkan is very curious to be diplomatic. Uh, in the sense that we discover now, imagine if in 2004, 2006, we were delaying the entrance of uh, all the former Soviet bloc, I mean Poland, Hungary. Imagine nowadays what could have been. So at that moment, of course, the treaty procedure was shorter because there was a geopolitical point of view to unite Europe. And nowadays, the southern eastern dimension should be united for the same geopolitical reason, in order to avoid influence in the, in the region coming from external actors uh, uh, within the European Union. So it's complex, yes, for sure, because enlarging so much the European Union mean, will mean also to discuss how we, uh, we rule the European Union in terms of decision-making process, in terms of uh, unanimous uh, veto power from the different countries. 
But this is the political destiny of our community, uh, to unite the continent, to unite the differences, to help the differences to come in a, in a different way. Uh, for sure, Milciadis was mentioning the disorder that we are living nowadays. We, are, we have a culture, a Europe is the, the basic idea is the liberal democratic, uh, uh, let's say, architecture that means freedoms, means process also of uh, discussing uh, when we have the discussion on the rule of law in Europe is not so easy. But this is a process that historically helped the country to, to move and to change. We know that nowadays it's not possible that this idea will be shared with other global actors, mentioning China, mentioning Russia, mentioning Turkey. They have a different uh, political and constitutional, in case also changing constitution, that will bring in another way. This means that the idea that the, we had 20 years ago that the liberal democracy will be uh, all over the world and will be the, the mainstream of uh, the political uh, uh, let's say landscape doesn't work anymore. But this doesn't mean that we have to give up from our value. And especially in our continent, the social protection, the liberal democratic uh, um, issues uh, should be the, 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 also the elements where we, we base our enlargement process. So to be concrete, the feeling of joining the European Union from other countries uh, the previous one and the new one should be uh, reflected in a political way. Then there will be also the procedure based on the treaty, for sure. But first of all, we have to, if we want to, in this new global disorder, to be a global actor that has an ID and this, uh, let's say, brave and also not so humbled of our ID, we should also politically answer to this question and to move ahead. So for this reason, I think that the Commission should present a project and we have to, to clearly analyze. But the main message nowadays to Zelensky, to the Moldova, and to all the countries that belong to liberal democratic future and vision in this chaotic world is yes, you are part of our history and especially you are part of our future. That is something that we believe. Keeping in mind that we're running out of time, Mr. Vavitsiotis, is this a good time for enlargement? I fully agree with what has been said for the Western Balkans. We are going to lose, and we are going to lose big if we don't move fast. There are countries that are waiting at the doorstep for more than two years. Yeah. Serbia is waiting 15 years. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's important to, to see with whom we march. And I'm. Well, our Prime Minister has done a lot in order to, to soften, and we have done a lot to soften all these objections uh, coming uh, for, uh, for North Macedonia. I think it's important that we should give it a green light. The situation in the country is fragile in terms of political results. We have to keep, as Europeans, we have to keep one thing alive, that the European ballot is always a winning ballot on every single election. And we have to make it sure that this applies in our countries and also to the countries that are affiliated with us. Otherwise, this European flag will not mean so much as it means today. Thank you all for this discussion. I think we covered some uh, very basic uh, topics. It was very uh, interesting. And thank you for joining us. Thank you.